Welcome to the Catering Feed, the Catering Growth Podcast, a show about growing your catering business and restaurant industry trends, powered by Easy Cater. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. I'm here today with Frank Beard from Gas Buddy. I am so pumped, no pun intended, <laughs> to have Frank here today to talk about his complete obsession with the sea store industry. Frank, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me on the podcast. So, Frank, before we dig in today, I feel like it's always good to talk about some really cool trending news. And a lot of people have been buzzing about the fact that Wawa is now offering catering at all locations. And I grew up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, so I I totally understand what a way of life Wawa is. And I can imagine why a lot of people want to take that off premises. But what's your take on this? I mean, it makes sense to me. I Wawa is one of those stores that you drive out of the way to visit. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's an interesting time for the industry because you really have to differentiate yourself. I mean, last mile retail hasn't had a lot of competition over the years, but it's here now and it's it's really good. I, I mean, I can open an app like GoPuff if I'm in a town that has GoPuff and I've done this. Uh, they'll bring whatever you want to your door in like 20 minutes. Right. They're so fast. They give you a loading bar like Domino's even. While and, you're hanging uh, out watching a TV show. Yeah. And you can spend $6. It's like five ninety five to join the fam, their, their loyalty program or whatever. And um, yeah, they'll knock out delivery fees for basically $6 a month. So if you're someone who just discovered Stranger Things uh, and you don't <laughs> want to leave your couch for maybe the next two weeks, well, they'll bring it to you. So for convenience stores, you really have to differentiate yourself. And Wawa's done that through food service as good as anybody has. And so, I mean, catering's only natural. And the food's great. I would cater it. I think also they've they've built this really strong following. I met one of the leaders at Wawa, and I kind of fangirled a little bit and said, I'm a really big fan of your work. And he said, let me guess, you're from Pennsylvania. Because, like, <laughs> it, it is. It was something that, you know, people almost felt like they were being – it was sacrilegious to go to a Starbucks instead of going to get Wawa coffee. Yeah, I mean, Wawa, there was an article that came out last year that said they sell 200 million cups of coffee a year. And the coffee's great. They actually sell single-use, like, K-cups. Um, I have a collection of K-cups from all the C-Store brands. Of course Because I'll do. take them home and make it. It's it's kind of fun to, you know, compare them. But, but yeah, Wawa, I mean, they sell their coffee uh, to take home and make as well. Like, people love going there. Do you see this being a, a really pervasive trend in the C-Store industry that a lot of operators are seeing this opportunity not just to differentiate themselves inside the four walls, but start to expand outside the four walls with something like catering? Yeah, it's, you know, it's a challenge because I think some brands are hesitant to remove the customer from the experience they've created in the store. Um, but catering is a huge opportunity. It's like we we have some operators in this industry that have absolutely incredible food service. And it's just one more way to get that food to customers. Um, there's actually there's a lot of independents who've developed really amazing food service programs, who've experimented with catering as well um, and have had some success with it. So I think it's only natural now that you're seeing these larger brands like Wawa see the opportunity and they have their food service at the point where they can actually do real catering. Like it's cater worthy if that's a thing. It's it's that kind of thing. <laughs> it is now. You heard yeah. it here for first, folks. <laughs> so, you know, to go from your 30 day challenge to now being able to, you know, just dive into the world of C stores every single day. How many C stores do you think you've been to in your oh, life? Oh gosh, it's been thousands probably at this point. I I counted for a little while and then I just stopped. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I got into this through like a very non-traditional way. Um, started through this thing called 30 Days of Gas Station Food. And what that really was is, you know, I'd gone through a massive weight loss experience. And any anytime you do that, you just kind of naturally get tuned into the whole discussion about healthy living. It just ends up happening. And I kept hearing this uh, theme that eating on the go is like part of the so- so-called problem. I'm like, well, that's not true because at the time I was traveling basically five days a week. I got to do something to challenge this. And well, and I thought it'd be something simple like, hey, I'll just, uh, I thought I'd eat at gas stations for a week. And well, I had a lot of time to think about this because I was driving to Kansas City from Des Moines. And about five minutes into the drive though, it just clicked. I was like, you know what? No, no, no. Let's let's make this really extreme. Let's do gas stations for an entire month. And then let's document the entire thing. I mean, that sounds crazy, right? And for people who don't know much about Gas Buddy, tell us a little bit about Gas Buddy. So Gas Buddy is really interesting, actually. We This is a very fragmented industry. It's probably like the biggest $650 billion industry that no one knows anything about. Amen. And Gas Buddy is unique in that we tie together a fragmented industry. Um, I mean, about two-thirds of the industry are single-store owner-operated, meaning it's a person that owns one 
convenience store, but then your major brands tend to be regional as well. So it's really hard to tie together this fragmented industry and Gas Buddy is essentially the platform that does that. So people, we have about 12 million active monthly users, 80 million downloads. I think we were rated, this study came out, said we were like the seventh like most positively uh, reviewed app on the Apple App Store, which is pretty impressive. It's pretty impressive. That's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. It's a very big so. deal. And so people use essentially our app just to find a place to go. It's their perfect pit stop is what we like to call it. And so for some, that's about checking gas prices to get the best deal. Uh, for others, that's looking for something else. You can rate and review convenience stores. You can evaluate what's on the next route. We even have we even have QSRs coming to us now to advertise in our app because they're trying to get our app users to come to their stores instead of going to eat at a convenience store. So it's a yeah, it's a pretty cool feature. And it seems pretty innovative for those those restaurant operators and brands to be thinking about what is that share of stomach and see that C stores a are pretty legitimate competitors, but also learn some lessons from that industry. A lot of my former colleagues at California Pizza Kitchen all lived in Texas. And so I have to tell you that, you know, from as a New Englander and a kind of northerner or a Yankee, as they would call me, I've always thought of convenience stores as somewhere where like, okay, I go in, I get my gas, I maybe go grab a Dasani and some gum, but that's about it for me. Like up here, that's my experience. Until I went to a Bucky's. And Bucky's, <laughs> Bucky's in Texas uh, changed absolutely everything for me. So whether it's a Wawa or a Bucky's, can you talk about these gas stations that really are so much more than a gas station and that experience that they're offering for, for their customers? I mean, I think the chapstick I used a second ago, <laughs> I pulled it out of my pocket. I'm like, oh, that has a Bucky's logo on it. So, and your pop socket on your phone right now. You know, it, honestly, the pop socket, so for anyone listening, I have a pop socket on the back of my phone. That's the Bucky's logo. <laughs> and it's pretty worn down, but I've got another one ready to put on there when it expires. And the thing is, it's honestly a conversation starter about the power of branding. And that's half the reason I have it on there. The other half yeah. being Bucky's is awesome. But it's just, it's more than a, it's more, it's more than a gas station. It's more than a convenience store. Like they make retail fun and people forget that retail should be fun. Yeah. Like it should be an experience when you go somewhere. It, and that gets misconstrued a lot where people think you have to do all this just silly stuff, but it's just about making it's creating a place that a person will drive out of their way to visit. Like if you can't answer, why would someone drive out of the way to visit my store? Then you should probably start thinking about that right now because your competitors probably are. And Bucky's is a great example. Like the food's amazing. The merchandise is hilarious. Uh, the bathrooms are just huge. I, I mean, you'll see rows and rows of, of urinals and stalls. And I'm like, is there, how, how can it, <laughs> How can that? How how could there ever, ever be that many people to honestly need that? Of course, I'm sure there's days where they do, but I mean, they put artwork in the bathrooms. It's insane. Um, I just never knew that I could be so interested to see an entire wall of dried meat. That was uh, yeah. <laughs> something that I never imagined, or that I could go and see 25 different types of. We were talking about slap your mama, but 25 different types of, you know, uh, meat rub and hot sauce and a full hot bar, like something that would put Whole Foods to shame. I mean. I mean, it really is a, a really special type of place. Their merchandising strategy is so hilarious because it's like, all right, instead of putting a few things here, uh, let's build a wall of meat. And then on top of that, let's put let's put a row of stuffed uh, stuffed animals of the Bucky Beaver. <laughs> and let's not put two or three of them. Let's put like 100 of them yeah, and absolutely. line the entire wall. It's just everything's like bigger, louder. Um, but what people forget, they, they succeed so well at just may, having a clean friendly, mm -hmm. well, you know, like just nice store. Yeah. Um, the shelves are always faced. If, if there's scuffs on the walls, they, they sure seem to be fixed quickly. Like nothing feels old or dated or dirty ever in that store. It's just re it's, it's retail 101, but they succeed at it and they do it with a store that's 65,000 square feet. And I think one of the things that I really early on fell in love with restaurant branding and hospitality is when you can create an emotional, visceral reaction and they feel like they belong to that brand. Yeah, definitely. And that's how, and Bucky's does that probably better than anyone I've ever seen. It's just when you, when you see that logo, you get excited. Um, and, oh, their highway advertising is the best. You've seen those billboards, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> I, I mean, for anyone who hasn't seen these billboards, they'll put these massive billboards up that will say things like your throne awaits, talking about the restrooms or um, the 
top two reasons to visit Bucky's are number one and number two, or it'll just say like beavers. And that's all it says. It's just beavers. <laughs> there is a photo someone shared on Instagram where this other, uh, I think it's a, a truck stop, um, had put up a billboard saying clean restrooms, you know, four miles. Bucky's put a billboard above it that said you can hold it 20 miles. <laughs> and when you see that, you smile, but it, it's fun. They just, um, yeah, they built an amazing brand. Sheets has done a good job too. I would tell anybody to follow Sheets on Twitter and just watch how they interact with their customers. It's unbelievable. And, you know, this is a time when everyone's talking about loyalty programs and rewards programs. I mean, every retailer's got them. You, every store you go to tries to hit you up with one of these. It's just another app to download, you know, because we, we already have our core apps we use and you got to have a real compelling reason to download something on your phone at this point. And you're... Yeah, as a consumer, I'm really fatigued by these things. But Sheets, they don't say, oh, we have loyal customers. No, we have Sheets freaks. It's part of this whole strategy to just like, you know, make this amazing, cool brand. It's almost like this club that you're a part of. And their customers, I mean, look at them on Twitter. They go on and promote the brand for Sheets. Sure. And I think, again, so many of restaurant brands are trying to think about how do they create community? Mm -hmm. That's always such a buzzword. How do you com create community inside the four walls? How do you engage with external community to drive traffic back inside the four walls? But now we're looking at things like virtual community. And I know that Sheets is a brand that really masters that digital community. Yeah. And there's some there's some restaurants that have done a, a pretty good job with this, too. Um, isn't it Denny's that has a really funny Twitter account? Now, I'll be honest, I don't know if it necessarily makes me want to eat there more, but I sure love the Twitter account. I mean, if anything, <laughs> we're talking about a, it right now. So we yeah, it's on the right. Yeah, I mean, if anything, it creates a positive brand impression. So that's that's good. But it's just, you know, some of the QSRs, um, you know, we've all had that experience where we, we go in a store, you see some tables aren't wiped down. Maybe the people behind the counter uh, just clearly don't want to be there, um, which reflects poorly on the brand. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to get excited about being there um, as well when the employees aren't even excited to be there. And it, it's really it's really hard to turn people into brand evangelists at that point when that's mm -hmm. what they get at your store. But then you go in a store like Sheets, you get great customer service. The employees are so, th they, they sure seem thrilled to be there when every time I visited. Um, that's because they hear Frank Beard was coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, but they're, um, it's just a whole different experience. I mean, a good example of this is you go on a quick trip with the K or KT. Mm -hmm. They're in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Northern Iowa. I don't know how they do this, but it seems like every store has a small town community feel. Every single one of them. It's like they find that one person that might volunteer in a church kitchen on a Sunday afternoon yep. and serve up you know food to people who stay afterward. It's that it's old lady who knows everyone in town, yep. knows all their business, is like the center of all the gossip. Yeah. And they find that person and they hire her and they have her giving samples out at the store. Sure. It's amazing that, that they, they're so good at this. And I went in a store and I maybe didn't want to buy glazed donuts, but I sure want to try a sample of a glazed donut. So this lady comes up and, would you like a sample? Yeah, I'm going to take <laughs> one of those. And that, I mean, they're... Their baked, their baked goods are off off the charts. They're amazing. And she could see it on my face. Right. And she looks at me and winks and she goes, you need another one of those. No better salesperson out there than that. She, she didn't tell me where they're located, what the price is, <laughs> or, you know, those awkward conversations that people who are bad at samples tend to right. do. She just wanted me to try sample and be happy. Yeah. And you know what? That'll bring you back to a store. Absolutely. But, Who's going to say no to that grandma? But it's easy to get excited <laughs> about that brand. Yeah, for so, sure. So again, you know, thinking of a, a woman who's really entrenched in the community, that kind of, that church lady, I'm thinking of like the SNL character, you know, handing out those tastes of donuts. Again, not what a lot of people think of when they think of a convenience store. So what percentage of people are going to a gas station or convenience store just to get fuel versus, you know, how often are people going in and engaging with that retail side of the business? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stats that have come out on the conversion rate from the fuel forecourt to the store. Um a lot of them tend to come in around 50%. I, I've seen I've seen 35% uh, drive away after refueling. I've seen 50. I've seen as high as 70. Honestly, it's really just going to vary on the particular retailer. But let's just say for sake of argument that it's half, half of the customers drive away after refueling. Re for retailers, it's a big challenge to invite them back into the store. And they have to really overcome a lot of challenges with this because... Let's be honest, there's a reason why the stereotype of a dirty gas station exists. Yeah. Um, you know, a friend, friend of mine likes to, um, a friend of mine at a cleaning company likes to describe the past number of decades as the dark ages of restrooms <laughs> <laughs> and saying that we've finally gotten out of the dark ages of restrooms. And I think we have. Um, but there's a very 
real reason why that stereotype exists and still does today. I remember but, reading a New Yorker article that talked about 82% of women will not go back into a you know place of business if the bathroom is dirty. It's that implication of if you're not t- taking care of the bathroom, what does the back of house look like? Oh, exactly. And, you know, we did the survey at Gas Buddy that I uh, that I put together. What's cool is like we can run a survey uh, through our app and we'll get 20,000 responses in a few days. So, and these are 100% driver audience. So it's the people you want to survey anyway <laughs> right. about these things. And it's really cool. So the survey, I filtered everyone into, um, you know, how, how often do you visit a convenience store? So I took the people who are very fre- frequent visitors and then asked them, well, how do you evaluate a store? Um, when you're fill, you know filling up your car, mm-hmm. how do you decide what you know what factors influence whether or not you go inside? And the number one reason was just the curb appeal of the store. Sure. It's the appearance of it because people don't really want to visit a dirty place, and when they have the choice um, to not visit one, they're not going to visit the dirty store. It's just, and when you're getting into food service, you're right that this makes a big difference because if you go into a restroom that's filthy, or if you go to a table that's not wiped down, that reflects poorly on everything about that store, including the food. It seems though like the C stores who are doing a really phenomenal job with food service are seeing immense growth. And a lot of that is in part to their attention to detail, understanding the you know importance of high integrity with food quality. Who are those brands that you see really, you know, thinking about food service in a different way? Yeah, there's definitely some who have an interesting approach. So, you know, here's here's something interesting. When you say thinking about it in a different way, what was it? A couple of years ago, the McDonald's put touchscreens in, right. and suddenly everybody wanted to talk about and everyone was touchscreens are coming it. to it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean it's cool. They have some nice touchscreens. I've, I've used them, but I was, I guess, I was sitting here thinking, has anyone not been? Have these people not been to a convenience store that are writing these articles? Right. Wawa, I think it was two thousand two that they started doing touchscreens. I mean, there there were operators doing this like ten years before McDonald's did, and. So that was definitely thinking differently about food service because it was not a common thing early on. But I mean, now it makes sense. Why not just have a touchscreen where I can tell them exactly what I want and more importantly, what I don't want. Maybe I don't want a certain ingredient. Maybe you have a picky kid with you who doesn't mm-hmm. want green things on his sandwich. Right. Um, and so that that ability to customize your food, C-stores are really early adopters. So you see a couple brands though that are doing some neat things right now. Twice Daily is a great example. If you're in Nashville, Go to a twice daily. <laughs> there are newer stores that have uh, their coffee brand inside. They, rather than saying twice daily coffee, they created white bison coffee, which kind of has that halo effect. It looks right. like a coffee shop. I mean, right. it is a coffee shop. I walked into a store that had a full third third wave coffee program. They're doing single origin pour over coffee. Like that was amazing. <laughs> Just a total foodie experience. Yeah. Uh, they had the beans uh, measured out into these little glass vials with cork stoppers on them and weighed out, uh, you know, properly. So then they'd pull one of those out. They'd grind it up. They had this, like, pour-over machine that's built into the counter that dispenses a perfect temperature of water. And, I mean, gosh, I think I paid less than $4 for that. It put anything to shame I've had from a coffee shop in the last couple of years. There was not a single negative um, aspect about that coffee when I when I took a sip, and there was such a flavor complexity behind it. It was really impressive, and I'm like, I'm doing this while looking out the window at a Shell fuel canopy. <laughs> and the cool thing is, I ran a speed test on their free Wi-Fi, and it was 70, 75 megabytes per second download. It's better than I've seen from coffee chains. Yeah, where I'm hitting 15, maybe 20, maybe maybe less, especially if the uh, you know if everyone writing the next great American novel moves into the store and starts slowing down the Wi-Fi network. So. You know, the laptop brigade shows up, but it was amazing. So that's, that. That's a, and their sandwiches were off the charts. So that's a great operator. Uh, another one I would say is really good. These guys don't get a lot of attention. It'd be Pana down in Florida. Pana, new Latino food. Absolutely incredible food. If you want Venezuelan or Colombian food, like that's where you go. All and right, sign me up. They started in a convenience store near Miami and they've since created some of their own QSR locations or I think they're in another convenience store too. So it's kind of a mix between C stores and QSRs. Um, but they have a, a huge hot box for your grab and go. But what's impressive is their open grill that they have. Uh, anything you want on that menu, it's, it's just going to be amazing. It's all made fresh right there. They do catering too, which maybe they should be talking to Easy Cater about this. But yeah, so they're they're a good operator that doesn't get a lot of attention. Um, or hey, let's just mention the elephant in the room, Casey's General Stores. Like that's where I'm from, Des Moines, Iowa. I've grown up on Casey's Pizza. It's like the, it's like the eighth wonder of the world. That sausage <laughs> breakfast pizza is 
astonishingly good. And meanwhile, we're seeing this immense demand from the catering customer, from these really high-profile whales who are ordering on a regular basis for everything from, you know, the office party to executive meetings to client meetings, that breakfast is such a high opportunity for, you know, food service operators to start to fulfill that need. So again, now you're thinking about C stores coming in for that share stomach. How how are these C stores who are really diving into catering going to change the landscape of restaurant catering? You know, it'd be it'd be interesting because let's say let's say you're at an office um, and you walked into a conference room and you know those kind of like coffee catering. I don't know how to describe them, those big containers that you right. can pour it out. Yep. Imagine if that was if they were all black containers or like kind of. Uh, um, kind of like a brown, you know, like a like a butcher paper or whatever that that is, okay. and it just has a big uh, Quick Trip logo on the side, uh, a QT logo. Nobody would bat an eye at that and think yeah. that that's going to be bad. They'd probably be excited that it's there. And that's the thing is these brands, people trust these brands. Like right. they 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 they're already associated with quality. So suddenly, if they start doing catering. Um, that's, that's really just going to crowd out some of the restaurants that are doing it, too. Well, I feel like from the second we both uh, bonded over Bucky's, I knew it was just going to be a great conversation. So hope you all enjoyed and learned a little bit more about how much commonality there is in the sea store and restaurant world. Yeah, this has been great. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Catering Feed listeners, if you love this podcast episode today with Frank Beard, well, you are in luck because there was so much awesome dialogue that we asked Frank to hang out a little bit longer. And we have another episode coming your way in three weeks. So stay tuned and learn a lot more about the sea store industry. Thanks for listening to The Catering Feed, powered by Easy Cater.